Hey, let's start off with some sample diploma questions. So make sure you try these on your own before watching me go through them. The magnitude of the impulse of an object that of the magnitude of the impulse that the object experiences from 0 0.4 to 0 0.86. So you got to be careful with this one, right? Um, so you should know that impulse is equal to the area into the graph. But uh, if you look at the scale, right, this is 0 0.82, 84, 86. So the third line over is 86. So this, ooh, and I go a little bit faster than that. Ooh. There we go. So with all the squiggles in there, uh, that is where we want to go, not to the very top. We only want to go to 0 0.86, right? And because it's a triangle, we go base times height divided by 2. So my height is easy. Uh, my height goes to this point right here, which is every tick is 0.1. So we have 3.5 newtons. My base is a little bit trickier, right? This is 0 0.86, and this is 0 0.04. Right? Everyone is 0 0.02. Um, so my base down here is going to be 0 0.82. Right, if I subtract those two numbers, that's what my base is, 0 0.82 seconds. And then we have to remember to divide by 2 because it is a triangle. So when we do that, uh, just let me open my calculator here. So we go 3.5 times 0 0.82 divided by 2. 3.5 times 0 0.82 divided by 2 we end up getting uh, 1.44 as our impulse. Okay. A hockey puck that has a mass of 0 0.185 kilograms is sliding along an icy surface with a velocity of the south. When it's struck by a hockey stick, the puck makes contact with the stick uh, and then leaves the stick sliding at a velocity to the north. Right? So I'm going to make south negative, north positive, uh, so this is going to the south, so this is negative. Mm. Let's try that again. This is to the south, that's negative. This is to the north, that's positive. Um, average force, so we're going to use force times time equals mass times change in velocity. Move the time down there. And remember, this is final minus initial. So the mass of the hockey puck is 0 0.15 eight kilograms. The final velocity is to the north, 25.3, and the initial velocity is negative 13.5 meters per second. Right. And it says that it's all in contact for 0 0.122 seconds. So when we plug that into the calculator, 25.3 minus negative 13.5 times 0 0.158 divided by 0 0.122. We get 50.2, and it's positive. I said positive is to the north, so positive 50.2 to the north. Okay, this one here. Uh, which of the following rows describes the status of the airbag in front of dummy one and the impulse experienced by dummy one compared to dummy two? So you're doing an airbag safety test. Two identical crash test dummies are placed in vehicle equipped with airbags. If they have to use crash test dummies or else this question is super messed up. Uh, the airbag in front of one of the dummies is disabled so that it does not function. The car is then crashed into a rigid barrier so with sensors within each of the dummies to record the force acting on them during the collision, right? So if, remember that impulse is equal to force times time, and if time is increased, force is decreased. So what airbags do is they increase the time it takes you to stop, right? You can either hit the airbag and almost trampoline-like hit uh, that airbag as it slows you to a stop, or you can hit the steering wheel, which is going to which is going to stop you instantly. But that force is going to be way higher, right? So an airbag is going to have increased time it takes you to stop, which decreases the force. So this one here 
is airbag, and here is no airbag. Right, bigger force, no airbag. Um, the area under the force time graph is impulse, and you have to remember that impulse is equal to mass times change in velocity. So whether you have the airbags or no airbags, this mass is going to be the same, because that's going to be the mass of our crash test dummies. And no matter what impulse we, or sorry, what, no matter if we have the airbag or the no airbag, our change in velocity is going to be the same, right? If I'm going 60 kilometers an hour to stop, that, that's going to be the same. So what that means is our impulse is going to be the same. And you can be like, well, this one has less force. Yes, but it has more time, right? Because force decreases, increase, time increases, it's going to keep the impulse between both of them the same. And if you found the area under each of these graphs, you would find that they have the same impulse. The impulse does not change when we change the time. The force changes to keep the impulse the same. So airbag one is disabled and the impulses are the same. The areas under the graphs are the same for both of them. Okay, so let's do conservation of momentum. So curriculum stuff, explain with numbers the concepts of impulse and change in momentum using Newton's laws of motion. So you need to be aware of Newton's laws of motion. Uh, explain qualitatively the momentum is conserved in an isolated system. Explain with numbers that momentum is conserved in one-dimensional interactions in an isolated system. And compare and contrast elastic and inelastic collisions. So some key terms you need to know, elastic and inelastic collisions, isolated system, you need to know what that means in terms of physics 30 and momentum. And uh, that's what we're going to do. So systems. So the definition of a system in physics is different than an isolated system in chemistry, right? So remember in chemistry, in science 10, you might not remember, but we did learn about this. You have your three types of systems, right? So your first type of system is if you have, so this is a pot uh, filled with water in here. This is an open system, right? Because if we heat it up, that's my heating element, oh, that's not bad, uh, water can leave and also energy can leave, right? So in an open system, both matter and energy can enter, they can leave, that's what an open system is. To change this to a closed system, uh, what we need to do, that's my heating element, is we put a pot on top, right? As soon as we put a pot on, uh, sorry, a pot on top, a lid on top, it becomes a closed system. Well, what's allowed to enter or leave? Well, energy can enter or leave. Right? That energy heat can enter leave, but the water molecules, when they heat up, are trapped by this lid, and then they come back down and they stay in. An isolated system is if we took our pot of water and we heat it up, and then we put it in an insulated container. Right? So if we put it in an insulated container, now all of a sudden, like a thermos or something, energy can't leave it. Energy can't enter, it can't leave because it's insulated, right? Um, matter can't enter or leave because it's trapped in this insulated container. So matter and energy can't enter or leave, just energy can enter or leave, and matter and energy can both enter and leave the system. That's what it was. So that is not the case in physics. Don't use that. Uh, we are not using that in physics. So in physics, this is totally different. This is momentum based. Uh, nothing the same with what I just talked about. Uh, there are no external forces acting on objects. So, for example, friction. Okay. If you have an isolated system, momentum is always conserved. Always. Okay. Um, so, usually when we're talking about an isolated system, we're talking about a collision. So ball A and ball B. If we make them both balls, they roll. There's not a lot of friction with rolling. And what's going to happen is they're going to go, they're going to hit each other, and they're going to bounce the opposite way. Right? That would be an example of something with an isolated system. Because there's very little friction, there's no external forces. Examples of something that isn't in an isolated system would be if we had something that was sliding, right? So like a puck or something like that. So if these guys came and hit each other, well, they're not going to bounce back 
the same way because there's a lot of friction and we can't really analyze that motion. Another example of something that's not isolated is if we took our balls here and we tilted it, well, all of a sudden we'd have this force of gravity acting on it, which would act as an external force. So because we have that, it's like the parallel component inclined planes, we don't do that, but um, because we have that external force acting on it, it wouldn't work. And with this, because we have that force of friction, which is an external force, um, it wouldn't work. Okay, so in an isolated system, you don't have these, these ones. So this is not an isolated system. This is more of an isolated system. If you can get it to roll, get rid of that friction, make it nice and level. Okay? Um, energy does not have to be conserved. Energy actually has nothing to do with it being an isolated system a lot. Isolated system means no external forces, which means momentum is conserved. That's what you need to know about an isolated system. Law of conservation of energy, super easy, way easier than law of cons so, sorry, law of conservation of momentum, way easier than law of conservation of energy. So momentum before equals momentum after. So you might have one momentum before, two momentums before, right? You can have as many momentums as possible. You could have three, you could have four. And then momentum after, we use this little tick. That means after. Right? You could have one, you could have two, you could have three, you could have four. And then we can break these down, right? M1, V1, M2, V2, M1, V1 after, M2, V2 after. That's why we don't use like 1 and 2 for after, because we have 1 and 2, 1 and 2, and then we just use that little tick for after. Hey, you don't have to use that. It doesn't matter, uh, but the tick works. It's easy. So let's do some examples. 1.1 uh, times 10 to the 3 kilogram car traveling east at a velocity of 25 kilometers an hour, collides with another car traveling west at 15 kilometers an hour. During the collision, the two cars lock together. What is the velocity of the cars as they move together immediately after the collision? Okay, so I'm gonna to switch to my whiteboard for this so I have a little bit more room. Makes life a little bit easier. Uh, first thing you do is you need to draw a picture of before and after. Before, you have the smaller car, 1.1 times 10 to the 3 kilograms. Um, it's traveling east at 25 kilometers an hour. It collides with a car traveling west, and the car is heavier, so I'll draw it as a little bit bigger, 1.3 times 10 to the 3 kilograms and it's traveling slower, so I'll do a smaller arrow, 15 kilometers per hour that way. Okay, because we have things going in opposite directions, we need to create a positive and a negative. I'm just gonna make right positive, left negative. So this is moving to the right is positive, left is negative, or I guess east and west. East is positive, west is negative. So I've established my positive and negative. After you have this car, that's both of them together, and they're gonna have a combined mass of 2.4 times 10 to the three kilograms, right? So you have this big combined mass together, uh, and which direction are they gonna be going? Well, I would predict that it's gonna be going east because this has a momentum, this has a momentum, this has almost double the speed, but this doesn't have double the mass, right? So I'm gonna guess that they're gonna be going that way. Okay, and we're trying to find out what's that speed after. So we're gonna use physics principle number four, conservation of momentum, where the sum of our momentum before equals the sum of our momentum after. Uh, before we have, I'm gonna call this one and two, and this is one and two. Before we have the momentum of one and the momentum of two, and then after we have the momentum of one and two. So now I'm ready to break them down. Um, I'm trying to find this. So it'd be M1V1 plus M2V2 is gonna equal mass one and two and V1 and two. Right. And because I'm trying to find this, I can move my mass one and two 
down below. And now I can fill in some numbers. So mass 1 is 1 1.1 times 10 to the 3 kilograms. It's moving at positive 25 kilometers per hour. It's fine to keep things in kilometers an hour as long as they're all the same. Mass 2 is 1.3 times 10 to the 3 kilograms. And you're moving at negative 15 kilometers per hour. And we divide it by their combined mass, which is 2.4 times 10 to the 3 kilograms. Okay, so I'll type that all into the calculator. So start a bracket 1.3 times 10 to the 3 times 25. Oops, it's 1.1. And I'm going to add it to 1.3 times 10 to the 3 times negative 15. Let's get an answer for that. And divide it by 2.4 times 10 to the 3. And their combined speed is positive 3.3 repeated. I think we have two sig digs in the question. It's in kilometers per hour. Um, so, and it, because it's positive, it's moving east, kind of like I predicted. So you need that direction in there, and that's our final answer. Another type of example that you can have um, is a, a hit and bounce example like this, where a cue ball is traveling east, collides with a stationary colored ball of equal mass. After the collision, the cue ball is traveling one meter per second east. Uh, what is the speed of the colored ball? Right? So I'm just going to draw it on here because it's actually a pretty easy question. So you have before, you have your, uh, your cue ball, and it's traveling east at 3 meters per second. And then it hits a stationary colored ball of equal mass, so we'll make it the 8 ball. Uh, so it's stationary, and then after, it sounds like they're both moving. So after the collision, the cue ball is moving one meter per second east. So we want to find out that eight ball there. How fast is it moving? Right. So again, we can use physics principle number four. We can say that... Uh, the momentum before equals the momentum after. I'll just call these one and two. One and two. So before we just have momentum of one. Don't put two on there because, well, it doesn't have any momentum. And then after we have the momentum of one after and the momentum of two after. Right? So we're trying to find information about the momentum of two. So I always recommend rearranging in this situation. So I'm just going to move minus P1 after this side so we get p1 minus p1 after equals p2 after because we want to find out information inside of here this you don't have to do it in that step but i just find it easier and then we break it down m1 v1 minus m1 v1 after equals mass 2 v2 after so we have a problem here because we know the math we know the velocities right this is three this is one but we don't know the masses but we do know that they're equal mass. So what that means is we don't actually need to put 1 and 2, right? I can erase this 1 and I can erase 2 because they all have the same mass. And now when we have mass in all of them, it cancels out. And then it becomes a really easy question. So V1 is 3 meters per second. V1 is 1 meter per second. So it ends up being 2 meters per second. That's our answer. And it's going to be east. That's it. That's how we do it. The last type of example that we're going to see here with one dimensional is an explosion. So explosions are pretty straightforward too, so I'll just do it on here. Um, so again, we should start all these questions with a before and after drawing. Um, but not like that. <laughs> uh, before and after drawing. So it's talking about a gun firing a bullet. So this is my gun, um, and then this is my bullet. 
So in before the bullet is in the chamber, right? And after they fire, uh, we have our gun like this. My gun is going that way, and then my bullet is going that way at a much higher speed, right? So this, so with explosion ones, we're still using physics principle number four, where our momentum before equals our momentum after. But before with explosions, it's just sitting there. It has no momentum, and that's fine, right? After, we'll call these one and two again. We have the momentum of one and the momentum of two. So what this tells us with all explosion ones is that the momentum of one is always going to equal momentum of two in the opposite direction. And lots of times I just take this off because I know they go in opposite directions. That's what that negative means. So we just need m1v1 is equal to m2v2. We want to find the re recoil velocity of the gun, so I said the gun is one. So we just have to move mass one under here. And mass two is our bullet. So it's a 0 0.05 kilogram bullet. And the velocity of the bullet is 275 meters per second. And we divide that by mass one, which is five kilograms, right? And what we're going to end up getting when we type that into our calculator is 2.75 meters per second. So 2.75 meters per second, right? Um, and I would want to add the direction because it's saying the velocity, it would be backwards. Oops. I keep on hitting my eraser accidentally. So it's backwards. Backwards. Yeah, and that's it. That's an explosion. Pretty straightforward. So another term you need to know, we're sort of shifting to a different part of this lesson. You need to know the term elastic versus inelastic. So momentum is conserved in all collisions in an isolated system, right? This is like point number one. That's kind of what we were doing there. We were finding momentum. Um, point number two, which is totally separate, is if we look at kinetic energy, Kinetic energy is not always conserved in collisions in an isolated system, okay? So if a collision is elastic, that means all of its kinetic energy will be conserved, okay? Uh, so if the collision is elastic, if all the kinetic energy is conserved. So a collision is inelastic if not all the kinetic energy is conserved, right? So uh, our kinetic energy before is oops, I don't know what happened there, is greater than the kinetic energy after, right? So we lose some of the energy if it's before, like this is bigger and this is smaller, right? Kinetic energy before is greater than the kinetic energy after. So in real life, no collision can be perfectly elastic or perfectly inelastic. Perfectly inelastic meaning that you'll lose all of the energy. So some of the energy will be lost and some of the energy will remain after the collision, right? So uh, all real collisions are going to be partially elastic and partially inelastic. So um, anything that, that, that's not 100% though, we consider technically is inelastic, where some of the kinetic energy is lost and some of the kinetic energy will be present after. So the only type of real elastic collisions are subatomic collisions. They, they come as close to possible as being perfectly elastic. Um, however, you will see some physics questions in the book that are elastic. So things that stop and go. So an object collides with another object of equal mass head on, the first object stops completely and the second object gains the exact same velocity the first object had. That can't happen in real life, um, but that would be an example of an elastic collision. And you can come close to that depending on what you're using. In and out, two identical objects collide head on, they both rebound with equal and opposite velocities. And then one and two out, and this is sort of like a 2D question where they move at right angles to each other, they have identical mass. So um, we can get these physics world, perfect physics world questions that, that have these elastic collisions, but they wouldn't happen in real life. Only subatomic particles can have elastic collisions. So 
So inelastic collisions is when kinetic energy is not conserved. Um, and a good way to tell if something is inelastic is if you have any breaking, crumpling, bending during collision. This is evidence of inelasticity. So this picture looks quite horrific, uh, but the person in the car accident survived, and cars are meant to do this. So cars are meant to crumple. Um, when they crumple like this, it kind of works like an airbag. It increases the time, decreases the force on the person. Um, that's what they're meant to do. But anytime you see crumpling like this, it means it's an inelastic collision. Momentum can still be conserved, but it's an inelastic collision. And anytime you get two objects to stick together, there has to be some crumpling to get them to stick together. That's evidence of inelasticity. Okay, so we're going to do a board question. And there's going to be three questions involved with it. So uh, we're going to try to find the velocity of the 0 0.3 kilogram ball after the collision. Is the above collision elastic or inelastic? We're going to show that. And what type of system is this and why? Okay, so pause the video, give them a go to the best of your ability. If you can't do all of them, that's okay. Do them to the best of your ability, and I will go through them right now. So I'm going to switch screens. I'm going to switch to my whiteboard because there's a lot going on here. And I'm going to start off this question with, um, with uh, a before and after. So it says my, I have a zero point. Uh, two five kilogram steel ball is traveling east. So 0 0.25 kilogram is traveling east uh, on a frictionless surface. Ooh, uh, and it travels at 4.5 meters per second. It collides head on with a 0 0.3 kilogram ball that's traveling west at a velocity of 5 meters per second. After the collision, um, the 0 0.25 is traveling west. At 2 meters per second. So we want to figure out which way is the 0 0.3 kilogram ball headed. Okay, that's what we're trying to figure out. So um, we can use physics principle number four. Our momentum before equals our momentum after. And before we have m1 v1 and m2 v2. Actually, sorry, I don't want to break it down that far. I just want to go p1 plus p2 is p1 after plus p2 after. Uh, the reason I didn't want to break it down that far is because, so this is 1 and 2, this is 1 and 2. I want to find information about P2 after. So during this step, I want to move P1 after over, so I get P1 plus P2 minus P1 after equals P2 after. I find students are more successful if they move it over while it's all together like this, because so, they don't know how to rearrange if things get all broken up. And now we're ready to break it up. So M1 V1 plus M2 V2 minus M1 V1 after equals M2 V2 after. So we want to find V2. So we just have to move M2 underneath. Okay. Now I'm ready to plug stuff in. 0 0.25 kilograms times V1, 4.5 meters per second. Oh, I've got to be careful. I've got to set up my positives and negatives. So I'll make this positive, this negative, and this negative. Okay, always got to set that up. So this is positive 4.5. And then I add it to M2, which is 0 0.3 kilograms. Multiply that by negative 5 meters per second. And I subtract M1, which is 0 0.25 kilograms. And then it's moving negative 2 meters per second. And I divide that all by mass 2. Okay, so let's plug this into our calculator just like we have it here. So 0.25 times positive 4.5. Close the bracket. Add on 0.3 times 
times negative 5, and then subtract 0.25 times negative 2. Get an answer for the top, divide it by 0 0.3, and I end up getting positive 0 0.4. I got two sig digs in the question. Meters per second, and the positive means it's traveling uh, east. And that's my answer. So I got my velocity after the collision. So the next part of this question is asking, is the above collision elastic or inelastic? Well, if we're talking about elastic or inelastic, we need to look at kinetic energies. Okay. So what I need to do, I'm just going to erase this. And now I know this one is 0 0.42 meters per second that way. Okay. And I'm going to find out if my kinetic energy before, the sum of my kinetic energy before equals my sum of my kinetic energy after. I want to find out if it equals. I'm not sure if it will. Right? So I'm going to do 1 half mv squared of this one plus 1 half mv squared of this one. I'm going to find an answer for before. And I'm going to do 1 half mv squared after plus 1 half mv squared after. And I'm going to find an answer for this and see if they equal. That's how I find out if it's elastic or inelastic. Right? Uh, so 1 half 0 0.25 kilograms. I'm just going to erase all of this. Um, times my velocity squared, so 4.5 meters per second. And then I'm going to add it to. 1 half, 0 0.3 kilograms, and uh, so this is a negative, but you have to remember that energy is scalar, so that negative doesn't actually matter, and you don't want to put that negative on there, because energy is scalar. I'm getting an answer for this. Okay, and then I'll do the second part, so I'll do after 1 half, 0 0.25 kilograms times 2 meters per second, and then 1 half times 0 0.3 kilograms, times 0 0.42 meters per second. Okay. And because the negatives and positives don't matter, you should already see that mm, this isn't going to be elastic because those first mass speeds are a lot bigger than the second speeds. But let's just get some numbers for it, just so we can do that. So I'll do before. I square those speeds. So this is my energy before. So this is 6.28 joules. And then after, oops, I'll go second enter. And the only thing that needs to change is my speed after is 2.0. And then after for this one is 0.42. I should use a full number, but I didn't save it. All right, and that's my kinetic energy after 0 0.52 joules. All right, so 6.28 joules does not equal 0 0.52, so it's inelastic. Okay, my last question is saying, oops, what type of system is this? So this is a tough question that a lot of people get wrong, right? Um, what type of system is this? So we have two types of systems in physics. We have isolated, and we have non-isolated. So if you are isolated, it means you have no external forces. No friction, level ground. In this question, it says that it's frictionless. It doesn't say anything about the ground not being level. So to me, it looks like we have an isolated system. A non-isolated system is if it had something to do with um, 
friction or a non-level ground would be the most common ways to see. Okay? So we can be isolated and inelastic. We can be isolated and elastic. We can be non-isolated and inelastic. They're two separate ideas, but this is our system. And it's important that you don't mix up elastic and inelastic and isolated and non-isolated. So for Newton's third law, you got to know about Newton's third law in this. For every force, there's an equal and opposite force, right? So let's watch this video really quick here. You shoot the gun. It's a big gun. You get some recoil, right? Wasn't expecting that. Sorry, I didn't mean to close that down. Let's uh, bring that back up. There we go. Um, so when you sh <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> when he shot the gun, uh, what were the two forces? Right. So the two forces is that there is a force of the the gun, uh, the main force that we focus on, the force of the gun on the bullet, right? And that's going to be equal to the force of the bullet on gun, F-bomb. Um, so that's how those work, right? If, if you had a car crashing into a wall, what are the two forces? Well, you have the force of the car on the wall. And that's going to be equal and opposite to the force of the wall on the car, right? And one of them is going to be negative, one of them is going to be positive, but that just refers to direction, equal and opposite. Okay, when force of gravity pulls a ball to the ground, what are the forces? Well, we have the force of gravity, the most significant one, of the earth on the ball, right? The earth pulls the ball towards it. But that's going to be equal and opposite to, well, the ball has mass, right? It, it has a gravitational field around it, even though it's really tiny. But the ball is going to pull the earth towards it. It's just so tiny that it doesn't actually do that because the force is so small and it doesn't really affect the earth. So that's how Newton's third law works, right? So with our impulse formula, we have forces in there. Force times time equals our impulse, right? Impulse is what for when objects are colliding. So this object collides with this object. The forces are going to be equal and opposite, right? So we know that the forces between these two are the same. Time, well, this is time they're in contact, right? So the time is the same. So if the time is the same and the force is the same for each of the objects, the impulse acting on each object is going to be the same. And people get this wrong all the time because what people do is they focus on, well, they're not going to be the same for this, right? If I have a bigger mass, well, I'm going to have a smaller velocity change. But what's going to happen is it's all going to work out to make the impulse the same. But it's better to focus on this when we're talking about Newton's third law. So when two objects collide, their impulses will always be equal and opposite no matter how much bigger, how much smaller one is than the other. So I have an example here to show this to you. So a 30 kilogram curling rock slides at 2 meters per second north. It is caught by a 75 kilogram player and they both move together afterwards. Determine the velocity of the player rock e immediately after catching the rock and then we're going to use that to determine the impulse of the curling rock and the player. So I'm going to switch to this whiteboard here because I need a little bit of room and I need to draw some pictures. So we have um, before and we have after. So before, we have our curling rock is traveling north at 2 meters per second. And then we have our guy over here. Yeah. After, we have our guy. We have, he's holding on to the curling rock. And then they're going to move upwards. I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger. This is 2 meters per second. We want to find out this. What is the velocity of the, of the player and the rock when they're holding on to each other after? Okay, so this is 1. This is 
2, and this is 1 and 2. So physics principle number 4, mm, let's do it over here. Our momentum before equals our momentum after. Before we have momentum 1, and we have uh, no momentum 2 because it's not moving. So we have momentum 1, we just, or sorry, momentum 2. We just have our rock moving. After we have momentum 1 and 2 moving together. Okay. Break it down. <laughs> I always use 1, so it's weird. Uh, M2V2 is going to equal mass 1 and 2 and velocity 1 and 2. So we want to find the velocity of the moving together afterwards. That's why I would move mass 1 and 2 down here. And I plug in my numbers. So, so mass 2 is my curling rock, which is 30 kilograms. The velocity is 2 meters per second north. I'm going to make up positive. There's nothing going down, so that doesn't matter. And then the mass of our curling rock and our player is going to be 30 plus 75 kilograms. So those are two masses that they gave us for each of them together. So that's going to be 105. So all I have to do is go 30 times 2, which is 60, divided by the masses added up, which is 105. And I get that to be, they're going 0 0.57 meters per second north afterwards. Okay. So the second part of this question is determine the impulse of the curling rock and the player. So I'm going to find the impulse of the player by just going mass times change in velocity. So velocity final minus velocity initial. Okay. The player is 75 kilograms. Okay. The final velocity of the player is it's going that 0 0.57 upwards. And its initial velocity is it stationary. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get an answer for that. This over here. So I'm going to use my full answer. It's really important you use your full answer for this. I'm going to multiply that by this minus zero. Didn't really change it. And I get my impulse for the player to be positive 42.9 kilograms meters per second north. Okay. Now I'm going to find my impulse for my rock. And I'm going to do it the same way. So the mass of my rock is 30 kilograms. The final velocity of the rock is at positive 0 0.57 meters per second. And its initial velocity was the 2 meters per second. Okay. So on my calculator, I'm going to go 30 times the speed of the rock and the player together, and I'm going to subtract 2. It's positive 2 from it. And look at that. I get negative 42.9 kilograms meters per second south because it's negative. And that makes sense, right? When the player and the rock collide, right, the player experiences a force that way. Oops, sorry, that's my calculator's in the way. This is the player. The player experiences a force that way. The rock experiences a force that way towards the south. Equal opposite force, equal opposite impulse. Right? And this one had a bigger mass, but a smaller velocity change to get this impulse. This had a smaller mass, but a bigger velocity change to get that impulse. It's always going to be equal and opposite. If it isn't equal and opposite, you did something wrong. Go back and check it. Okay? These are your questions. 1D collisions, elastic, inelastic collisions. Those are your questions. Do them. Talk to me if you have any questions.